so our first question then, uh, Alfie and Alicia, do you want to read your question? Nice and loud. How big was Brian Cross impact at Boris? Well, obviously, is the impact that Brian Clough and Peter Taylor had um, was massive to the club. Um, most managerial positions become available because the club's struggling, and at the time, Nottingham Forest was struggling a little bit. Um, decided to give Brian Clough the job after they'd seen how well he'd done it at Derby just down the road uh, previously, um, and Clough himself took the job, and then after about a year, brought Peter Taylor in to help him. Um, and then the two of them together changed the whole history of Nottingham Forest Football Club over the next A massive impact. And their biggest assets, I think, were that during training, they kept the players laughing. Um, even when we occasionally lost the match, they would still keep the players laughing. And all the rumours about Clough being so strict and nobody could step out a line, they're not quite true because, you know, obviously we had a very happy camp and you can only have a successful football team if everybody to a degree gets on with one another and and everybody's enjoying what they're doing and you couldn't wait to come in for a training session because it was that much fun in the end. Um, never mind, couldn't wait for the next match. So, you know, they had a massive impact and, you know, will long be remembered, not just in the history of Nottingham Forest Football Club, but the city itself and obviously the rest of the country in Europe. So, you know, a massive contribution to football in a successful way. Thank you. Um, Theo and Emily, what's your question? Which football team did you support when you were younger? Well, when I was younger, um, it took me into my teens, really, before I, I kind of supported any football team because when I went to junior school, we didn't play football. Um, even when I went to a senior school, they didn't play football. Uh, and I used to captain the cricket team and I captained the rugby team and I wanted to be a tennis player. Um, but, but on one of my trips up to Scotland, I, I stayed at my grandmother's and I had my cricket bat with me and my rugby ball and some of the local lads were out playing with the football and obviously they didn't want to play cricket or rugby. So I joined in and started playing football when I was about kind of 12, 13 years of age. Um, and if you're in Scotland, of course, you're either a Rangers or a Celtic supporter. And when I was playing with my friends initially, not knowing anything about football, um, they said to me, are you a green or are you a blue? Which means green for Celtic or blue for Rangers. And now I, I didn't really like the colour green, so I thought I'll go for blue. I like blue <laughs> colour better. And then they would say to me, oh, you're a Rangers man, aren't you? you know, and I, I didn't actually know what they were talking about. Um, it was quite funny because, you know, the place that I learned to play my football in Scotland, a small town called Bowness, um, the famous Rangers player, John Gregg, his wife actually came from Bowness and used to live just next door to my grandmother, where she used to stay. Um, so a connection there with the Rangers, but initially a little bit of ignorance, didn't know who the greens or the blues were <laughs> because I hadn't played football before. Thank you. Uh, Eva, Deacon. Do you have an inspiration? Do you have a person that you look up to or is an inspiration? If so, who is it and why? So that was, do you have a person that you look up to or is an inspiration? If so, who is it and why? Well, there's, there's lots of people that inspired me um, when I first became a football player. It was obviously Brian Clough. Um, and Peter Taylor, the management duo, really inspired me, you know, to believe in myself and in what I could do out there on the football field. But there were other people that I played with inspired me. Um, and when I went to Derby County, now they had a player called Dave Mackay, um, very famous Tottenham Hotspur player. And he, I found, was the, the best competitor um, I had ever known. And, and I'd been playing at Hartlepool's United for, for two years, one promotion there, came to Derby, played with Dave Mackay, and then realised I don't know that much about football because he was brilliant at everything that he did. And the thing above all else was that his attitude was absolutely brilliant. If he played you a game of head tennis, 
he would want to beat you. If he play, if he played in a five-a-side training session, he'd want to win. If he was playing a game of cards, he would want to win that as well. Um, so he showed me what a professional attitude should be like. There are no such thing as his friendly games of football, because if you're a footballer, you're a professional, you get paid to, to play, and you should want to win every match. And, and Dave Mackay was one of the, the players that inspired me um, as a young player and also taught me how you should behave if you want to become a better footballer. Uh, because although he was my captain and, and I respected him on the field, if I didn't do my job, he'd be shaking his fist at me and giving me a few words of advice on how to try and get better. So, so you learn sometimes the hard way, but learning from Dave Mackay was definitely a massive influence. From Peter Taylor. Thank you. Um... Godfrey, can I ask a oh yes, Mr. White, our head teacher is here to ask Hi, a George, question. Mr. White, head teacher. Hello there. Hello there. We, we've got a very big Liverpool fan in our classroom at the moment. Um, I don't know why I gave her the job to be honest on, <laughs> on that uh, issue. Just a question: Would your team, 1979, 1978, have won the league to play in the Liverpool team this year? Oh, the. There were similarities in, you know, we won, the, we won the league by seven points. You know, obviously this Liverpool side at, at present won it by more points. Um, and we won sort of back-to-back -back European Cups that you'd think, you know, would be good enough to put you, you know, in the history books as one of the best teams of all time. But Liverpool were the, the kind of benchmark. They were the examples that we tried to follow. Um, and And... Obviously, the, the first time that we really played against them where there was a massive piece of pride at stake was obviously the European Cup because the, the European Cup, obviously, once you've qualified for it, um, it's quite strange, really, because when we were listening for the draw to be made, um, the players are talking amongst themselves, saying, oh, I want to go to Spain, or no, I, wa I want to go to Germany. No, no, I want to go to France. And then we end up drawing Liverpool in the first round. So we're not even leaving the country, which is quite ironic because it was called the European Cup in those days. Um, but, you know, they, they were a fantastic side in those days. We managed to get the better of them on more than one or two occasions. But the present Liverpool side are, are, are you know, obviously better than we are because statistics will tell you that. Um, and, you know, they seem to be great in every department and, and even... When they change players round or players come in for someone who's injured, they always seem to be able to maintain that very, very high standard. Um, so, you know, you could say that the present Liverpool side were better than the team that I played for in the late 70s, early 80s, but it would be nice to have a game against them just to try and prove it. <laughs> because, you know, but obviously that's impossible. Um, but no, I always really respected Liverpool Football Club anyway. Um, I love Liverpool's sense of humour. Um, you know, they've got a great sense of humour, most people from Liverpool. And, and obviously playing at Anfield when there was a full house um, was a tremendous, tremendous feeling of, of, of pride and, and real enjoyment when you run out there on the park. Now, the only thing that annoyed me once when we played against Liverpool was that obviously in those days, the cop was full. The main supporters end of the ground at Anfield the cop was full an hour before kickoff, and we'd gone out to look at the, the surface of the pitch to decide which pair of boots we'd wear or what size studs we'd wear for the game and obviously we're out there an hour before kickoff, and the Liverpool fans are busy giving us some real grief you know chanting you know and telling us how good Liverpool are and we're going to get hammered and um, so John Robertson walked actually into the the, the Liverpool penalty area with the cop full um, in front of him and pretended to put a football on the penalty spot and took a couple of steps back and then <laughs> pretended to put the ball in the net, raise his hands <laughs> and start jumping about as if he'd scored a penalty against them. And then when we were coming off to prepare for the game, you know, one or two of the lads said to him, Robo, I don't think you need to wind them up that much. <laughs> He said, I think they're already wound up anyway. So, so you know, that was a piece of real brilliance from John Robertson, just to show he was comfortable coming to play at Anfield. <laughs> but a great side, a great side, you know, the present day side, you know, massive talents in all areas, you know. Thank you.
James and Alex, what's your question? If you wanted to play for Forest, which of the team would you have liked to play for? I think it, I think it would be Barcelona. Uh, because I'm a big fan of Lionel Messi and I just love the way that he plays football. And He's a brilliant example of, of, of being a good professional as well because when he gets knocked over or tripped tripped up and fouled, which he does on numerous occasions, you know, he just he kind of picks himself up and dusts himself down, uh, then gets the ball, beats three men and sticks a, a goal in the top corner. So, you know, he gets on with the game. He doesn't pretend he's injured either, which a lot of the modern-day players do, which really does annoy me. Um, Barcelona, I mean, to play in front of you know, 100,000 crowd at Wembley's uh, as we did at Nottingham Forest in, in, in three consecutive League Cup finals was brilliant. You know, at Barcelona, they play in front of about 80, 85,000 every week when they're at home. So, you know, I would actually love to play there um, in Barcelona. Thank you. Sam? Who do you think is the best um, manager in the Premier League currently? Well, obviously, you're judged on results if you're a manager. You know, so Jurgen Klopp. But um, believe it or not, I used to think that Eddie Howe, who was manager of Bournemouth, a club where they got gates of 11,000, uh, should have been given manager of the year when he kept them up year after year. Um, also, Sean Dyche. Um, Burnley's done a great job there and do doesn't maybe get the total recognition that he deserves because we know that the Liverpool manager or the Manchester United manager or the Chelsea manager is going to get millions and millions of pounds to spend on bringing in some talented players that gives them a better chance of winning trophies. But I like to see the, the ones like Eddie Howe that used to be, at, as I said, at Bournemouth, uh, Sean Dyche, players that manage teams where they have got a very, very restricted budget but still managed to get good results, keep their teams in a higher division than maybe, you know, they're capable of doing. So so it's all right being the top manager and getting the most money to spend on players. Um, but I think there should be a little bit more recognition of how good a job of management that managers do that keep their teams in the Premier League with little money to spend. Well, thank you very much. That's been great. Okay. Give John a big clap. Yeah. Good day.